Hi, welcome to Hot Mess History. I'm your Hot Mess historian, Janet, and we are talking about Henry VIII's second wife, Anne Boleyn. I wanna take this opportunity to provide a brief disclosure. Some of the terms and events that we'll be discussing in this video may be sensitive to some viewers. I encourage you to use caution and discretion while watching. Unfortunately, Anne's official date of birth is unknown because during this time, birth records were not really diligently kept for female children. We do know, however, that she was born between 1501 and 1509 to Thomas Boleyn and Elizabeth Howard. She had two siblings, Mary and George. I'll be using the term court frequently and want to provide further explanation of what that term means. In the 1500s, a monarch's home was the center of the nation. Wherever the monarch resided, he or she would be surrounded by the court. These were people of high rank and their servants. Anne's father was a well-respected diplomat serving Henry VIII, and when Anne was about the age of 12, Thomas was given a diplomatic mission that included serving in the French court when Henry VIII's sister, Princess Mary, was marrying the King of France, Louis XII. Both Anne and her sister Mary served as maids of honor in Queen Mary's wedding and remained close to her after she wed. They became fixtures in the Queen's household serving as ladies-in-waiting. While serving in the French court, Mary and Anne uh, were educated in the ways of flirtation and seduction, really just how to use their feminine wiles to manipulate men and elevate the status of their family. During this period of time, that really was the goal of every family, elevate your status elevate your status and being women there wasn't really much that they could do other than make a good marriage so this education was really critical now in addition to learning the ways of flirtation and also learn the harsh reality of how mistresses were treated in the royal court while those women and their families were bestowed gifts elevated status they were also subject to no small amount of gossip notoriety and ridicule by the other members of the court when the Boleyn family returned to the English court around 1522, uh, they were bestowed many high honors due to Thomas's successful diplomacy in service of the king. Now, one of these high honors was that Henry placed Mary and Anne in Queen Catherine's household to serve as ladies-in-waiting. This was a common practice for the female members of families. Uh, like I said, there wasn't really much that they could do. But this was also a bit of a selfish practice for the king because he wanted to have ready access to potential mistresses as well. Anne's sister Mary actually became one of those mistresses. She and Henry carried on an affair for about five years. While Mary was occupying King Henry's time and attention, Anne was carrying on a courtship or flirtation with a man named Henry Percy. There's a lot of Henrys I know, so I'm just gonna call him Percy. Anne and Percy had carried on this secret courtship and fell in love. They were secretly engaged, despite the fact that Percy was actually very publicly engaged already to another woman. It's also important to remember that during this particular period of time, members of the court could not marry without the express consent of the king. Now, when King Henry found out about the secret engagement, he expressly forbid Percy from marrying Anne. It has been speculated that the reason Henry denied the marriage between Percy and Anne was because he'd already picked her out to be his next mistress, even though he'd been carrying on an affair with her sister for years. <gasps> The king commanded that the courtship or relationship between Percy and Anne be ended immediately. And Anne, um, Anne didn't take it very well. She was always opinionated and stubborn and really just refused to acknowledge that she lacked any kind of power because she was a woman. She threw one of her temper tantrums that would become famous in later years. And in retaliation to that tantrum, Henry banished her from court to return to Hever Castle. Now, Anne did not remain banished for long. Around 1526, she was recalled back into the service of Queen Catherine of Aragon. And it's upon her return to court that Henry really begins his seduction attempts to entice Anne into service as his mistress. Anne remembers her education that she received in France as well as witnessed with her own eyes with Mary's treatment. And she refuses to be a mistress. She is not cut out for that kind of life and she decides I do have power. I am going to be queen. 
just out of nowhere, I'm gonna be queen or I'm gonna be nothing. She rejects Henry's flirtations just enough to play hard to get. Keep him interested, but keep him back. Anne knew of Henry's not so secret love of courtly romance and used that knowledge as well as her training in seduction and flirtation to put into action her plan and plot for the long game. She sends him flirtatious letters and messages that keep him intrigued, but when he replies and sends her tokens like jewels fit for a queen, she very coyly responds that she, she doesn't have a royal status sufficient to wear such wonderful trinkets. I mean, this kind of thing infuriates Henry. It really works. He is obsessed. It's considered that Henry's obsession with not being able to have Anne was the catalyst for him taking action and moving forward with seeking an annulment in his marriage to Catherine. Henry sent his request for an annulment to Pope Clement VII in 1527, and while waiting for a response, continues to woo Anne, sending her the trinkets. When those don't work, he bestows upon her the title of Marquess of Pembroke, and this is unheard of thus far in English history. She is the first English woman to receive a title. So by 1533, Henry had been waiting for seven years for a decision from Pope Clement VII concerning his request for an annulment. He has received no response at all in seven years. And at this point, Henry is fed up. He says, to heck with it, I'm taking this matter into my own hands. I am the king, I get to do what I wanna do. He convenes his own English court to review the subject and make a legal decision. He stacks this court with high-ranking members of his English court. Bear in mind, these are some of his closest advisors, friends, people that he has elevated himself. What are the chances that they're gonna go against him and rule that it is in fact legal that he's married to Catherine? Does that make sense to anybody else? No? Just checking. While he's convening this joke of a court, he banishes Catherine from the palace from his life. You're no longer welcome here, get out. And moves Anne into Queen Catherine's bedrooms. Shortly after moving Anne into the queen's quarters, Henry and Anne are secretly married and she becomes pregnant like almost immediately. Now this throws Henry into a tough spot and he's the one that did it himself. He has to hurry up and marry Anne publicly so that every one of his royal subjects, everyone across the world knows that he is legally married to Anne because if there is any question to the validity of the child and the child is a boy, it's not gonna be a legitimate heir and what has this all been for, right? Anne and Henry are publicly married on January 25th, 1533. The joke of a court's official decision that the marriage was invalid actually didn't happen until March, but Henry's okay with that because again, he's the king. He does what he wants to do. Now, as we mentioned before, Anne was opinionated. She inserted herself into politics and attempted to act as an advisor to Henry about the events of the time. Henry's decision to take matter into his own hands in ridding himself of Catherine actually forever changed the future of England. Let's take a step back for a minute. In the early days of his marriage to Catherine, Henry and Catherine were devoutly loyal to the Catholic Church and worked together to strengthen England as a Catholic country. Each of them published many documents and pamphlets in support of the church. In 1521, Henry actually gained the title Defender of the Faith as a result of one such pamphlet being published in response to the attacks from Martin Luther against the Catholic Church in favor of Protestant Reformation. This simply goes to show how devout Henry was in his faith and the allegiance he held with the Catholic Church. Now back to the story. Anne was not a devout Catholic like Catherine and Henry had been, but supported Martin Luther and the Protestant Reformation that was occurring in Europe at the time. Anne did not shy away from sharing her beliefs with Henry and with his newly established advisor, Thomas Cromwell, Henry came to a realization that he was God's representative on earth. Now this belief and realization meant that Henry was no longer required to offer fealty to Rome and the Catholic Church, but to God directly and God alone. He broke away from the Catholic Church and created the Church of England. Anne gave birth to a daughter on September 7, 1533 and named her Princess Elizabeth. 
The princess's coronation was a very luxurious and grand affair, and despite Henry's notable absence from the event, he declared Princess Elizabeth his heir. This put Princess Elizabeth in a position higher than that of Henry's firstborn daughter, Mary. Now, Henry's devotion and affection for Anne remained firmly in place directly following the birth of Elizabeth, even though Anne did not give him the highly coveted son that he wanted. The doctors were reassuring him that she had gotten pregnant really, really quickly. There were no complications in the pregnancy or in the delivery. There's no reason she's not gonna give birth to a son next. Despite Henry's reaction and support of Anne immediately after the birth of Princess Elizabeth, Anne was never really truly sure of how secure her position would remain with Henry. She'd witnessed him throwing over one queen already. What was to stop him from doing the same thing to her? As her anxiety over securing her position grew, Anne trusted fewer and fewer people. The other members of the court never liked Anne. They didn't hide the fact that they didn't like her. So she never really had any friends or advocates in the other courtiers. Um, other than really her brother and sister. Now, she and Mary had been estranged for a while because Mary wed a commoner without Henry's consent after her first husband passed away. And this, of course, as we remember, is a big, big no-no. So Anne could not be seen having a relationship with Mary. That only left her brother George as the person she trusted most in the world. In January 1536, Catherine of Aragon, Henry's first wife, died. Very soon after her death, Anne has her second late stage miscarriage. Both of the children miscarried were able to be identified by the doctors as male children. With these events happening so close together, Henry gets to thinking again. Catherine is dead, so she cannot form any type of opposition. No one can support her and say any of his future marriages are invalid because she's dead. So that's done and done. We don't have to worry about that. The second is, Anne is unable to give me a son, just like Catherine. So how can I be rid of Anne so I can marry a third time and try to get it right this time? Anne's sister-in-law, Jane Rochford, offers Henry the solution he so desperately is looking for. I hope everyone is sitting down right now because things are about to get crazy. Are you sitting down? Okay. George's wife, Jane, testified that George and Anne had entered into an incestuous affair in an attempt to get Anne pregnant with a son. Now, in this scheme, Anne would, of course, pass the child off as Henry's child and thus securing her position as queen, having produced an heir to the throne. In her testimony, Jane also lists four additional friends of George and Anne who were somehow involved and participated, whether it was also having an affair with Anne and trying to get her pregnant, or they were simply facilitating rendezvous, they, they somehow were involved according to Jane. Whether Jane's testimony was true or not, Anne, George, and the four friends were all arrested, charged, and sent to the tower. Anne was charged specifically with adultery, incest, and witchcraft. Henry claimed that Anne had used witchcraft to bewitch him into an amorous relationship, resulting in him throwing Catherine over in favor of Anne as queen. I think we can all agree at this point, he's just kind of grasping for straws. Now, while imprisoned in the tower, one of those four friends confessed to all of the charges. Now, this was done only after being subjected to torture, so the confession is still in dispute to this day, but the damage was done. Henry needed no further convincing. George and the four friends were all convicted and sentenced to death. As queen, Anne was given a trial by her peers, meaning the high-ranking members of court, because remember, one, she's queen. Two, she was given the title of Marquess of Pembroke. She was also found guilty of all charges and sentenced to death. Remember Percy, Anne's first love? It's rumored that he was in the courtroom when the sentence was passed down and he became inconsolable and had to be removed so that the court proceedings could continue. After the sentence was passed down, Anne petitioned Henry for permission to retire in exile to a nunnery as he had once offered his first wife, Catherine, but Henry refused to yield. He did, however, grant Anne one last request and spared her beheading by ax. 
that was the traditional form of execution of the time, but could be clumsy and on occasion unsuccessful with the first or even second swing of the ax in removing someone's head. She was granted permission for her to have a skilled swordsman brought in from France to perform her execution. Anne was executed on the morning of May 19, 1536, after having been queen for just 1,132 days, earning her the moniker Anne of the Thousand Days. She was the first English queen to ever be publicly executed. Henry would remarry just 11 days later.